Welcome to the Advance Your Art podcast, where we talk about the journey from artist to entrepreneur and everything in between. You've worked hard to hone your craft. Now take it to the next level with tips, techniques, strategies, and routines used by successful artists to grow their businesses and careers. Now, let's get started and have some fun with your host, Yuri Cataldo. Hello, welcome to another episode of Advance Your Art with Yuri Cataldo. If you're interested in learning how to build a company, make money from your art, or transition to a new career, you've come to the right place. If you like this episode, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Today, it's my honor to sit down with Micah Grunewelt, filmmaker, business owner, and adventurer. Micah, hello, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, it means a lot. Of course, my pleasure. So how are things in your neck of the woods? They're really good. They're actually really good. Like I know that this year is a really a struggle year for a lot of people, but for me, I realized I kind of thrive in crisis and uh, being a creative and kind of hitting my existential rock bottom is really good for kind of creating art that means something and kind of figuring out, all right, where, where are we going and what do I want to do and how do I want to do it? And so essentially this year has been kind of amping everything up to a 10 and saying, all right, how do we rock and roll? Like, how do we push forward? How do we make something that we're proud of that we um, feel like we can actually do and kind of get good? Like I'm finally at that age where I'm getting good at the thing that I've been trained to do. Mm -hmm. And so it feels good to finally feel that skill set developing enough that I can start making it into something that people actually want to see. (laughs) That's always a good thing. Well, congrats, yes. congratulations on that. That's a, it sounds like a specially good feeling a, given, you know, even normal circumstances. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I mean, that's kind of the nature of this kind of field is it's really kind of torturous. Like I don't recommend what people do film most of the time. It really does put every single strain on you in every single possible way. It's both a right and left brain medium. And so you have to figure out how to plan and coordinate people's schedules, but then also sit and do the creative work and be vulnerable and put yourself on the actual page and bringing those two things together is not easy. And, but it's really rewarding. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest challenges that I've ever done, probably the biggest challenge and forcing me to do do that. Like I'm at a point in my life where I'm ready to embrace that sort of fear and challenge. And like, yeah, I get what people mean. They're like, yeah, if it doesn't scare the hell out of you, you're probably not doing it right. And I'm like, okay, I'm terrified, but I'll do it anyway. (laughs) So it feels really good. Well, good, good. So let's, before we get into what you're doing right now, let's back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So where did your love of film come from? I think it came from having a lot of time as a kid. So I was homeschooled. And so we'd finish school probably at around noon. So I'd be from like nine to noon and I would sort of be able to diligently do my classes and then we'd wrap things up and then I'd have the rest of the day to myself and I wasn't going anywhere. So I kind of just was at home. So I spent a lot of time kind of just imagining various different scenarios and I like to play out and act uh, like I used to have this old, uh, what is it called? cap uh musket one of those um oh like a cap gun yes cap gun and i would imagine every single different uh civil war reenactment or revolutionary war reenactment just myself out in the wilderness and i remember very clearly one time being shot and killed by an imaginary foe and just lying in the grass for hours because i was dead Mm -hmm. and you had to sort of actually be dead and I realized, I think there was something to that that sort of bolstered an imagination in me. Where like, that's kind of become my thing is like imagination and beauty. Those are the two things I value most highly. And I had a really imaginative childhood. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of took that skill and started developing a lot of other things. And I realized I loved audiobooks, And so I would imagine them in my own head. And so like the, the Narnia series, they did these great audio drama recordings of those. And I would listen to those on repeat. And while listening to them, I would do um, arts and crafts. So I was really into chain mail for a while. And then I did leatherworking and some blacksmithing. And so from a pretty young age, I knew I kind of wanted to do something fantasy related and something that was kind of beyond reality. And so then that kind of kept developing. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I had kind of an existential crisis around that for a long time. 
where I was like, I had heard, I always wanted to be the best at whatever I did. And so I would hear these stories of like Wayne Gretzky, who was a hockey player and he was skating before he was walking. And I'm like, shoot, I'm too old to be a professional hockey player. Like there was just, it felt like I was, I was becoming like 13, 14 and realizing it was already too late to be the best at anything. Mm -hmm. And then I found filmmaking, which was an art. And then I learned, oh, you don't have to be the best at filmmaking. You just have to be the best at what you do. And so then I was like, okay, cool. Now I can sort of do that. And so it developed a love. I had a friend and like most filmmaker stories start is a friend in the backyard um, shooting random little things on a, a flip phone that you end up having or whatever it can film, whatever you can get. And so we put those together and initially we wanted to be YouTubers, but then that kind of kept developing and we realized, is, realized we wanted to tell stories because most of the people on YouTube weren't telling stories at the time. They were kind of just doing like action scenes or skits or things like that. And we were like, nah, we want to do something a little bit more serious and a little bit bigger. And then that kind of developed into, um, I had a co-op program through my homeschool, which allowed me to get a free year of college. Hmm. And if it was a community college. And so then I sat with the, um, the person who sort of recommends where you should go and what you should do with that. And she was like, well, there's a film school that technically is partnered with a community college. You could get a free year of film school if you did this program. And so I was like, all right, well, I didn't plan initially on going to film school, mainly because in film, you don't really need a degree in order mm -hmm. to get to where you want to go. Um, and so, but it was a free year of school. So I was like, oh, well, why not? I mean, I get a free year of film school. Um, and then as soon as I did the orientation, I knew it was kind of my place. Like everyone around, it was the high school experience that I never got. It's like, mm -hmm. everyone was interested in the same thing. We all loved movies. We were all there and kind of young and bright eyed and eager to sort of figure out what this thing was about. And so I kind of found my people and I found my passion. And then I started really realizing like, okay, this is really, really fun. And so I spent probably two years in film school in that sort of mindset of like hanging out with friends and making cool projects. And then I took a year off and that was when I had moved out of my parents' house and started kind of putting together my own life and figuring out what I wanted. Um, I was working a job that allowed me to listen to a lot of podcasts. And mm -hmm. so I really got a most of my education from that, honestly. And so that made me start asking some bigger questions about life and philosophy and what matters to me and um, what is my purpose and how do I live a good life? And so I took that year off of, from film school to sort of figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And then I came back to film school ready. I was like, all right, now I feel like I have voice as a director. I feel like I know how to achieve what I want to achieve. So now let's just go see if I can do it. And so then I went back to film school and then I made a short film that did really, really well. Um, and it was really good. And I'm still really proud of that movie. Um, and then it kind of proved to myself, I'm like, okay, I think I can do this. I feel like I'm good enough at this to be able to make this into something. And so then I spent my final year at film school doing one giant project, which was kind of my thesis film. So that one, at that point I had met a bunch of people and had a good team and we made a big fan, a uh, big sci-fi movie. Um, and that was really rewarding. The movie ended up turning out, eh, it's okay. We kind of, I think, got caught up in a lot of the logistics on how to pull a movie off rather than what the movie was actually about. Mm -hmm. um, and also I got really high-minded. I wanted to get across really complicated ideas in a short period of time. And one of the important things I've learned with filmmaking is complex simplicity, which is you can either have a really complicated plot and really simple way of exploring it or really simple plot and explore really complicated ideas. And so there's kind of a balance that has to be had between what's complex in your movie and what's simple. Chris Nolan is a good example who uses really complicated plots, but then keeps the characters and how the thing plays out very simple so that we can still follow. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of missed that entire um, connection for that film, but that film taught me, I think, everything that I needed to know to kind of move forward. It was the first film that we had kind of done in a professional way. Um, we did all the proper paperwork and filling out the license and it was a $10,000 movie and and it was a big deal to finish that film off and realize hey we kind of failed and we did this giant thing that kind of failed um, but at the same time we knew that we were really proud of it and we knew that we had pushed ourselves to our very limit and that was really what we needed from that particular project so then I finished that entire film and then I realized okay well I've graduated. What do I want to do now that I'm done with school? And it was sort of, well, I think I want to start a business. But I had no idea how to do that. And I had no idea if I was going to be able to make money doing that, mainly because I was in film. And I had in my head for some reason that I was some art kid. And making money as an art kid is 
really difficult. But then I started the business with me and my business partner and we kind of started getting into it and kind of learning as we went. And then we quickly realized, oh no, there's a giant market for this. Everything is moving online and being able to make film in this age is like essentially being a coder. And so really it just came down to meet the right people, develop some good relationships. And then from there, the rest kind of was history. And so then as the business began to develop, it was like, I was realizing that was a really big strong suit that I had and I was really grateful for that. But also I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't fulfilled in doing that. It felt very much like we're making things that kind of get made and showed to a couple people. And it's, it's getting these businesses where they want to go, but I don't feel like I'm doing my best to work. And then kind of the pandemic hits and I kind of hit a crisis of like, all right, well, we don't know what this is. We don't know what this will look like. We don't know how this will change things. I feel like I've lived a pretty good life considering what do I want to do next? And then it was like, this movie. And I had been writing this script for two years um, with my co-writer and it had sort of been gestating in my heart for such a long time that it was, okay, now it's time to take all the skills that I have learned and put them into something that is my very best work. That is the culmination of everything that I have learned while still learning in the entire process. And so it's like, yeah, all these skills feel like they all developed to lead me up until this point. And I love that whenever you're like, oh my gosh, I did chain mail for five years of my life, just making these little bracelets and jewelry and armor. And I didn't know how that would pay off until now. And you're like, oh yeah, I wanna make fantasy movies. Of course this is gonna pay off. And so it's been really rewarding. Yeah, well, that's great. So let's talk about your movie then. So The Noble Animal, where are you or where are you at in the process right now with your movie? We're in pre-production. So we had been writing for the script for two years. I still have rewrites to do on it. Uh, that's the thing about a script is it's not really done until you shoot that, those, those frames essentially mm -hmm. till you're there on the day and you're ready to actually do it. So it's like rewrites and budgeting and planning. So essentially there's a, Filmmaking is a weird thing because it's kind of like a puzzle where you have all the pieces laid out in front of you and you know that they're all going to come together. You just don't know in what order and when. And so then you start with, okay, well, what are the ones that I know? Well, this section over here with all the blue, all right, all those pieces are going to all fit together, but then you don't know where in the rest of the puzzle that's going to fit. So you can kind of work on a little bit of everything at the same time. And that's kind of what I have been doing. So it's like, well, in order to get the budget that we need, I have to build the schedule and I have to build the timeline. And I have to know exactly what we need for each of these different scenes. At the same time, I can start storyboarding and figuring out, all right, well, what are my images going to look like? Well, I'm not going to know the budget until I storyboard because this shot requires us to get a jib and is going to require these three different extras, but we don't need sound on that day because it's just this one shot that doesn't have sound. And we're going to do that in post-production. Okay. What sounds do we need in post-production? Do we need a budget for that? Or do we need to pay a sound designer for that? Um, and so it's like kind of just, getting these estimates on where everything is going to fit into play. And I've made enough films now to kind of know, all right, I know what I can do. I know what I need to pass off to other people. I know roughly what it's going to cost, especially on an indie level like this. And so then I can kind of measure some of that out and figure out where we're going from here. So the next main steps for us is we got to shoot a promo that's really kick-ass. We need to really prove to everybody who is already following the movie that it's going to look better than every other indie movie that you see, that this is going to be a movie that could hold up to other things that you would see in the theater. That's something that I want to promise to the audience. And I really want to just prove to them that I know how to do it because I've been doing it long enough. Um, and so it's like bringing together those elements and then figuring out budgeting and financing and then getting our investor completely on board. So we have an investor lined up. It's all about sort of getting everything else lined up so that, that those dominoes can fall at the right time so that way we can shoot coming uh, end of next year is what I'm hoping for. Great, congratulations. So uh, so yeah, let's talk about your, I mean, your investor in the abstract. You don't have to give me any details on that. Mm -hmm. but, but what is it like finding an investor and going through that process? <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible, <laughs> absolutely horrible. I mean, it's so... It happens so dramatically differently with everybody. So it's like, well, there's a bunch of different methods of doing it. And I kind of tested out a couple of those different methods. One of which was, well, can we raise it from the friends and family that we know? And I kind of got a good measure of that, of like, how much can I raise from the friends and family that I know? And there is a certain pretty significant amount that you can get from that, but it does cap out at a certain point, mm -hmm. unless you happen to get that one person.